You ever needed a lock? So you go to the store and you want something that doesn't suck. So you go online and you take a look to make sure there's no security vulnerabilities, but well, there's a video of somebody picking it open. So you go to the next one and same thing and you realize the entire shelf of locks is actually insecure. You see, what you see on the store shelf is 170 year old technology and it's fundamentally flawed. Companies have stopped innovating. Take comb picks for example. Comb picks have been known about since the 1930s and they're still producing locks that have vulnerability to it to this day. Why? This really bothers me. And as an engineer, I wanna do something about it. That's why I wanna make an unpickable lock. Let's take a look at how these locks work and see what we can learn. Pin and tumbler locks are made of two parts, the core and the body. The interface between them is known as the shear line. Each pin stack consists of two pins, a key pin and a driver pin. These pins jam the shear line, preventing rotation of the core. When the correct key is inserted, the pin stack is raised to match the shear line and the core can rotate. Now this lock might sound secure. After all, it only unlocks when all the pins match the shear line, but it has to live in the messy real world where we have tolerances and friction and precision is expensive. Let me show you what that does to the pin and tumbler lock. Let's make the model of a pin and tumbler lock. First, I started by drilling four holes in the straight line in the core. But you'll notice there's slight variance in their position. They're not all the same distance from the edge of the part. They're not all the same distance from one another. And if you look closely, you might even see that they're not all the same diameter or round. Eh, it's the best I could do. So go ahead and drill four holes in the body. And I lay them on top of each other. And you'll see these, the variance in each of them start to compound. And you can see that there are locations where they don't line up. But it's the best I could do once again. So let's get four pins installed in here. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, got four pins installed. And the pins, of course, aren't all the same size perfectly because the machine that made the pins isn't perfect and there's variance in there. Now, you'll observe something very interesting happen when I begin to slide these two parts apart. And I'm gonna slide them such that they don't rotate from one another. And as I slide them, begin to slide them. Oh, they don't wanna slide anymore. Uh, I guess there's a pin here that's keeping these things apart. Oh, I think it's this one, okay. So this one feels lo a lot different from these in that it's, it's kind of stuck. So if I wiggle this one, oh, there we go. I got it back on top. And if we continue to push, oh, it stopped moving again. So let's feel around. Oh, this pin is binding. So I'm just gonna wiggle it a little bit. And there we go. And we keep going and it moved a little bit more. And okay, we move that pin and we keep pushing and pushing. And oh, now something is holding it up. Is it this one? Is it this one? Oh, it's this one. And wiggle it a little bit. Ah, there we go. And now I can pull these all the way apart and the lock unlocks. As you can see, I was able to use the fluctuations in position and size of elements within the lock against it. I was able to determine which pin was preventing the lock from opening. And I was able to move that pin such that it was no longer preventing the lock from opening. And then I was able to move on and figure out which one, which pin was preventing the lock from opening again and again and again until the lock was open. So in this way, you can see that I don't have to guess all of the heights of each of the pins all at once. I can just work on one at a time until I'm done. It's just a task to complete. I'm not guessing a password. I'm playing hangman and I have as many guesses as I want. Now I wanna give you some insight on what this looks and sounds like. We could use tools that look like this, but for the best viewing experience, I'm gonna use this tool right here. This is called a leashy tool. I'm gonna to insert the part that looks like a key into the lock. This part right here is going to allow me to apply tension. So basically I'm gonna rotate the lock with this. And then here, this part is going to allow me to manipulate the pins. So I'm gonna apply tension with my left hand. With my right hand, I'm gonna move this around. Once again, we're looking for the pin that's binding. So you can see very clearly pin one is not binding. It's, it's bouncy, it's on the spring. So we're gonna go down the line, feeling the spring, uh, feeling the pins, feeling the springs until we get to a pin that binds. So here pin five is, uh, is stiff. So we're gonna push that down until we hear a click. 
nice click out of five. And we're gonna go back to one. Whenever you hear a click, you can just reset. So one is springy, two, two feels stiff, so we're gonna push on that. Click out of two, a little bit rotation, back to one. One is a little stiff. All right, back to two, two feels good. Three, a little stiffness on three, click out of three. Back to one, same stiffness, price set. Two, three, four. Click out of four and we have an open. Now this is the slowest and most reliable way to open a lock, but there are other methods such as raking or combing that we saw earlier that may be faster. Most of the innovation in the past 100 years has been directed at trying to reduce the feedback and access to the pins, but there's only so much you can do with a flawed foundation. So if we can't rely on the precision of the lock for security, what do we do? Well, I thought a lot about this, and I think it comes down to a central concept, the separation of the setting and testing of pins. Let me show you what I mean. This is a front view of the pin and tumbler lock. You can see the core, the shell, the key, and the driver pin. And as I've demonstrated before, when we start to rotate the core, the driver will bind here at the shear line, and then we can use the key pin to basically push that up until we have some movement on the core and that uh, binding is released. To make that picking impossible, we need to separate the setting, which is the movement of these pins here, from the testing, which is the rotation and the testing of the shear line here. If we're able to do that, this conventional picking attack will be thwarted. Now, this is a very similar conclusion to the conclusion that Shane at Stuff Made Here came to in his videos. If you haven't seen Stuff Made Here, I would highly recommend his videos. Um, they're a lot of fun. And this is how I propose to do it. I've taken the core and the shell and wrapped them in another shell. I'm gonna to refer to this as the mid core now because it's also allowed to rotate. Now, we're gonna need some new pins. Here are the key and the driver pin, but I'm gonna add in a few more. I'm gonna add in two wafers and a master pin. Now, this group of pins here is going to allow us to do something pretty cool. Let me zoom in on it. The entire pin stack can move up and down. In this orientation, only the core is allowed to rotate. Once it has rotated, then this upper shear line is tested. And you can see that in this case, the driver pin binds. Let's try a different height. This one, for example. Now when the core rotates, you can see that this shear line here between the master and driver is correct. So we're good to go. And the lock can unlock. If we want to change the height that this pin stack unlocks at, we can swap out the master pin for one of a different length. So let's say this one. And you can see that this one requires the key pin to be lifted higher in order to get an unlock. For the first prototype, I decided to go with a scale model. Scale models are great at bringing things to human sizes. And in this case, this is a four times scale model. So it's four times larger than the actual lock since the pieces are so small. This is a two pin lock, which you can see here. And you can see the three main parts, the core, the mid core, and the shell. Now, this lock doesn't have any pins in it yet. So follow me over here and we'll get some pins in it. Like the lock, the pins are also 3D printed. I'm gonna get them assembled and show you how it works. Now that I've got the lock assembled with pins, I've got two keys, one that will work and one that won't, and let's try it out. Let's try the one that works first. So I'm gonna insert the lock, the key into the lock, and rotate the key. And you can see that I can rotate as much as I like, and bring it back. You can also try the one that doesn't work. Insert that key, and it doesn't rotate any more than this. The key knight among you may have noticed that there's actually a third pin stack in the back of this lock. This pin stack thwarts a possible attack vector where the core and mid core are bound together, allowing an attacker to pick the other pin stacks as usual. I'm gonna show you what this attack would look like. Then I'm gonna show you what I've done to prevent it. So what the attack would look like is, like I said, the core and the mid core get bound together or glued or something, they get attached together, and the key pin is able to be pushed up while the core and mid core are rotated. And as you can see, very similar to the pin and tumbler lock, you can pick this 
basically in the exact same manner. Um, all these pins in the middle, they don't do anything um, to prevent the picking. You could just go ahead and, and push up the driver pin to the shear line and pick it. So we need to make sure that doesn't happen. And in order to do that, we're going to bind the mid core to the shell while the core is vertically aligned. Okay, so that that interface cannot be tested. So what we're going to do is we're going to take out all the pins and we're going to take out the, uh, the core here. And in the back pin, pin stack, um, it doesn't have a spot for the key to touch it. Instead, it has just kind of this cammed surface on it. And we're going to bring back the driver pin and we're going to bring in a new pin called the watchdog pin. And this pin is going to prevent the mid core and the core from rotating while the core is vertical, while it's in this position. But once it has rotated, it is going to allow that interface to be tested. It'll allow them to rotate. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. So the watchdog pin sits on top of this uh, cam surface at the back of the core. And in this configuration, if the core and the mid core were bound together by some means, you can see that this driver pin in the back is going to bind is going to bind this interface. So there's no way for you to pick this. First of all, the the attacker would not have um, access to this, and second of all, they couldn't pick the other pin stacks because this one is going to bind at some point in that order. So it's going to prevent you from going through each of the pin stacks and, and doing making that attack effectively. And it needs to be able to release when uh, when it's time to actually test. So as you can see, as the core begins to rotate to its testing position, the watchdog pin is lifted up because it's riding on the surface. And now this interface here between the watchdog pin and the driver pin becomes available for rotation. And if the other pins are correct, then the lock will unlock. For the full scale prototype, I turn to MSLA. MSLA is a type of 3D printing that turns liquid resin into parts using ultraviolet light. It can create parts with higher detail than other printing methods. I don't really know much about MSLA, and this is the cheapest printer I could get on Amazon, so let's see how that went for me. So for my first attempt, you can see that the surface uh, quality didn't uh, turn out very well here on this core, and uh, there was also some uh, kind of stretching and shrinking in different dimensions, um, so I tried to mitigate that in uh, the next revision, revision B. Um, and I tried to mitigate that through two different methods, and an auto and a manual method. And you can see they turned out um, a lot better also because I changed the print orientation. Um, so if you know anything about science, you'll know that uh, changing multiple variables at a time uh, won't help you learn very much. So uh, this didn't help me learn very much, but it did set a baseline for uh, future versions. So this is Rev C. This is the first version that uh, I printed the core, mid core, and shell together. Uh, and then in this one, the core and uh, mid core kind of didn't go together very well. If you look close, you can probably see some sanding uh, marks. But the other thing that didn't go very well um, is you can see there's some resin trapped up in the top of the shell uh, where the pins need to go. So I had to fix that for the next version. So in revision D, uh, kind of added a slot here to let the resin drain out the top. Uh, works great. Uh, and then you can also see that uh, there's some uh, electrical tape in there. Um, all the parts do go together, but uh, I was running into some friction issues. Um, and that's kind of foreshadowing. <laughs> but uh, finally, we get to uh, revision E. Works. So uh, this lock actually works. So let's, uh, let's take a look at it. So you can see the lock is assembled. We've got some springs up here. You can see some of the driver pins right here. If we look on the back, you can see the uh, watchdog pin along with its driver pin and the pin that does the rotation. And then you can see in the front, all those key pins lined up inside of the, inside of the keyway. Now, while this lock works, it's a little finicky. It's a, it is a plastic lock made with metal pins, so it, you know. All right, I'm going to show you this lock, in fact, unlocks by uh, using the key that it was uh, pinned to unlock to. So I'm going to insert the key, just like that, and uh, I'm going to turn it. So you can see we get to this point, 
This is where it would stop if it was not the right key, but it is the right key. So it's going to allow me to rotate as much as I like. And uh, I'm going to rotate it back now. And there's that friction that I was talking about. It, it kind of it kind of sticks and it moves in a way that it's not really supposed to. And I think a metal a metal version would um, account for a lot of these issues. So I'm sure you're asking yourself, is this lock really unpickable? And that's not really something I'm able to prove to you. It's hard to prove a negative. Um, it would be very easy for someone to show a method to open this lock. Um, but I would say it's very safe against conventional methods, which use tension and binding to open the lock. It's, it's very safe against that because there's not a way to bind the lock and and manipulate the pins at the same time. It's just, it's just not possible. So I think that it's very safe against those methods. Um, there are certainly some methods uh, that I've thought of and you might think of if you look at this lock, um, but there's also ways to uh, combat those methods. Firstly, I'd like to say that it's, it's amazing that someone can make something like this in their garage in their free time and it actually works. Like, <laughs> that blows me away that that is actually possible. Um, but why am I working on this? I think that this problem is a very interesting problem, uh, first of all. And there are clearly other people which have embarked on solving this problem or demonstrating ways that you might be able to solve this problem. But what do I have to add to the conversation? I want to talk about manufacturability. If you want something like this to be in every home, you're going to need to make sure that it can be made for everyone at, at their budget, at their price point. And in order to do that, you can't have tons of complex, small parts. Um, we need simple shapes and simple manufacturing methods. So I think I'm gonna talk more about this in future videos, but uh, yeah, that's what I have to add. Let me know what you think about this lock, what security vulnerabilities it might have. Next time we'll be talking about design for manufacturing and uh, you're gonna to wanna to get subscribed because it gets pretty interesting. Thanks for watching.